Ray. <laughs> Welcome back at WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are we're positively having a great week. I mean, I, I, this is so much fun. I think the Ravens should go to the AFC Championship game and host it every single year, every single week, so we can have better guests on. Um, it's been fun this week. We've been. Um, it gives me a chance to open my Rolodex after being treated and being blackballed by the National Football League and not being able to go to the Super Bowl to sort of have Radio Row ahead of time because we're doing Crab Cake Row and we're doing that the week of uh, the Cup of Soup or Bowl. And I'll start on February 5th. Uh, the 5th, we will be at Fadley's downtown. On the 6th, on Tuesday, we'll be at Costas in Dundalk. On Wednesday, we're going to be at this guy's favorite place, Coco's Pub in Lauraville. Then on Thursday, to State Fair in Catonsville. And then on Friday, uh, back up to Pappas in Cotton. But we're hoping that the Ravens, that it's a big purple pep rally. We're going live old school radio from nine until five. And Marvin Lewis knows that Marvin, when it's live on the radio, you never know what Nasty Nestor is going to say, do you? Huh? Huh? No, no, no. And uh, I remember, you know, when uh, you were doing the whole deal, you were everything. You were the talent, the engineer, sound production, you know. You mean this morning? You mean like just like today? It was today again, so it's like back to your future. <laughs> it really is. It feels like being a solo artist again. It feels like I played a guitar and sang songs and then decided to have a band. And now I've just decided, no, no, no. This is this is way better to just do this this way. But, dude, I love you. I miss you. First things first. I mean, Lamar, you, you know, I had Joe Flacco on. I've had Brian. We talked 35. I had Brandon Stokely on today. I'm chasing people. Um, there's all of this, but we've never played an AFC championship game here. And I know you were chasing that in Cincinnati for two decades. We've been chasing that here since 1971. We finally have – Does that? that's weird, right, that there's never been – we've always been good, but there's something different about the expectation when you're hosting at home, and you know that. Oh, yeah, there's no question about the – you know, they having the opportunity to play home playoff games and obviously uh, the championship game, which leads, you know, obviously to going to play the Super Bowl and a chance to be world champion. So uh, it's quite a, quite a feat. Uh, you know, I saw many of the highlights of the game. I really didn't see the game being over here in Hawaii and I was working and uh, busy and uh, but uh, but but quite a game from what I saw. Well, I know you do a Polynesian Bowl and uh, all of my Las Vegas moles because I have a few because the Ravens might be going out there next week. Um, your relationship with Antonio Pierce and you working with AP and the Raiders and everybody in that locker room coming uh, to his defense to keep his job and your background at Arizona State. And I, I had to Google him a couple weeks ago because everybody your name came up and you and I are in touch and I text with you all the time. We don't see each other much unless we do this. Quite frankly, we don't visit a whole lot, but we text a lot. And I had to like Google up and I'm like, Oh yeah, Marvin was at Washington, Dan Snyder, and the ball coach, and the like, and then the Antonio Pierce and the Giants. Give me the first day you met him because you and I used to get together. Full disclosure, you and me and Schwartzy, we'd be over at the Pertucci's at the Lake Great Owings Mills Mall, and you'd have the crayons out drawing defense. But you loved the draft, and back in the days of Peter Bowlware and drafting players, and your time in Cincinnati and all of that. But you identified players you loved when you were young as a coach and guys that get in your space, including me, even crazy media people, you keep people, dude, you collect people and people collect you. Yeah. I, I, you know, Antonio was in his second year. He had made the squad the year before under coach Schottenheimer as an undrafted free agent. And he got to play a lot. He played the nickel backer spot. And when I took the job there with the, with the, uh, the Washington squad, <laughs> whatever they're called, <laughs> uh, you know, I was impressed with watching the tape and what he had done the year before as a rookie. So I had a plan for him. And uh, unfortunately, he had a high ankle sprain throughout training camp and didn't get to play in the preseason. And so he was upset. His wife was upset at the time. His wife at the time was upset. And she actually came and grabbed me after one of the games and said, hey, you know, he's been a bear at home. Uh, he's uh, he's upset. He's very worried. He's not going to make the squad is he going to be okay? And I said, yes, he's okay. Time to relax. It's going to be fine. He was so smart. He was the leader uh, as a young player. You know, I had, we had Jeremiah Trotter in that room, Jesse Armstead, LeVar Arrington, and, and AP was, was the leader. He was the glue and he kept things going. And, and obviously uh, he played that year Oh two and Oh three. And then his career took off from there. And then I got to reunite with him again at Arizona state in 2019. So, uh, you know, 
Uh, he's just been a wonderful person, has a wonderful family. I've enjoyed just uh, spending the time coaching alongside him. And uh, he literally, a couple hours before they made the change there in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas, uh, telephoned me and said, hey, I think this may happen. Um, I think I may end up being the interim head coach. Uh, when can you get here? <laughs> and and uh, I said, you know, I was still working with ASU. And, uh, and then I had my hip replaced Monday after Thanksgiving after the last ASU game. And uh, so, but they sent me a login so uh, I could log into their video system every day, watch practice. Uh, sent me, a, I made a folder. They made a folder on the system for me. I could put cut-ups in there, send notes to him and the coaches, and uh, uh, I just tried to help out, do what I could do. Well, I, I've known you a long time, and I'm thinking back to this 96, 97, 98, when I got to know you, you came in from Pittsburgh, and Phil Savage and Ozzie running the draft at that time, and you know you were trying to figure out every Kim Herring and Jamie Sharper and Peter Bulware and guys that we didn't get, guys from the Cowboys we thought we signed and we didn't sign, uh, as I remember it. Uh, but you know the things that happened that didn't happen, your recruitment of Rod Woodson and Goose came in, um, and, and all of these players. But you were always, you always love smart guys, and you always love guys that had a different kind of intellect. There were a couple guys you're like, this guy could be a coach. This guy thinks like a coach thinks. And you always love that in young football players. It was so important um, that they see the game, that, that you could relate it in that way, in your teaching way. But when you identify a young guy like that, and 20 years later, he's calling you as Pop Pop and says, come in, you know, I need you to be the spiritual, you know, backbone for, I've, I've taken on this job, oh my God, I need help. It's like calling the grandparents, which I know you're a very, very proud grandparent. W where are you in all of this? I mean, it feels like some days I see you out in Scottsdale and it feels like time's forgotten you, then you move to college, and then you're the sage guy, and then they have all these jobs and you don't get a call, and and then there are obvious Rooney Rule um. I don't know what to call it. I, you know, I, I, I found my tape of Johnny Cochran from 25 years ago talking about the Rooney rule at the Super Bowl in San Diego in 2003. And I don't know that it's – I mean, we could talk at length about what you've gone through as a coach. But to feel relevant again and to feel like, man, I can contribute here again and my guy got a job, somebody I believed in, I know that makes you proud as punch. It really has. It, it really was. Uh, to the last half of the NFL season, it was a lot of fun. Uh, being involved with the coaches, the players there, um, you know, and I was the background, you know, I was like one of those uh, speak when spoken to type situations, you know, and that's all I wanted to be. And, uh, you know, I sat along the back wall in the staff meetings and, uh, you know, I, I was there. And then, you know, the first week I actually got there, uh, Coach Coughlin, Tom Coughlin came in. Uh, Adam Gase was in and out quite a bit. Uh, Adam Gase had a relationship. Uh, with Bo Hardaway, who he had made OC. And uh, so it was really good that, and th this showed Antonio's spirit and his ability to realize that, uh, you know, this is a, a, a big opportunity. Uh, I, I'm ready for it. But you know what? Uh, having somebody else reinforce some of my thoughts is not bad. And that's what he did. So you got to respect that. Uh, and then the fact that myself, Coach Coughlin, Adam would all, Boom, get on a plane and be there like that uh, was great. Support team out there with the uh, Las Vegas. I almost called it Oakland. I almost made that. I'm not going to do that. I know they play in Vegas. Speaking of Vegas, um, Marvin, they're going to play a football game out there a couple weeks from now. Um, Lamar Jackson, and since you've been out of the league, you don't have to scheme these things up to try to figure this he out. put me out. <laughs> yeah, well, right. Yeah, you know, several people, right? Um, that style of football and, and I asked Brian this and maybe, and, and not flippant, but if I deliver you the Ravens head coaching job and John's out and you're in, it's 2018 and you get delivered a player like that and knowing what to do with it or not what to do with it or what you'd have to do, the investment of everything else, what this organization's done in five or six years to take a player that quite frankly, nobody wanted this time last year. Nobody was ready to rip up their deal and give Lamar Jackson the keys at 250, but nobody was willing to do that. He was out on the market. Um, there were other things in the draft and all that, but if it's a player you want, um, boy, he has a chip on his shoulder and the organization can stand proud after what they've done this year, keeping him healthy. But everything they've done here over the last year from turmoil in the contract 
to where they are to having this system and actually have it work this year the way they dreamed of it back when you were still coaching the Bengals. It took a little time and some injuries and some hardship, but they've made this thing work in a way that 31 other teams didn't sign up for Lamar in the first round that night. No, they didn't. And, uh, you know, to Baltimore's credit, to Ozzie's credit, uh, and Eric, they, they moved up to get him just because they figured they would need a quarterback uh, for the future. And, uh, you know, uh, literally, uh, we were coaching against him Lamar's first start. And, uh, you know, we didn't know he was going to start until Friday afternoon. And literally the first third down of the game, uh, some of the things we had planned, we had to throw out the window. Because <laughs> it was a different ball game. And, uh, and I, I really have been so, uh, what's the word want to say, excited for what he has done as a player and watching him. We spent a lot of time with Lamar before the draft, uh, both in Indianapolis, at Louisville, and in Cincinnati. And uh, uh, what he has done as a young man, and they came out to Arizona two years ago in the preseason, and I got to go watch practice. They were over, they practiced at ASU, and, uh, and he came over and, you know, gave me a big hug. And, you know, you forget how big he is, too. That was my first impression that day. I forgot about how tall, you know, his, his length. And, uh, you know, what he's done and as a player, uh, what he's, you know, going through the whole contract thing. Uh, I think, you know, he's always been in competition with Deshaun Watson, you know, all the way through his career, which has been kind of incredible also that they end up in the same division again after playing against each other in the ACC. Marvin Lewis is our guest. Uh, he has been doing Polynesian Bowl. So if you're watching out on the web. Those are real palm trees. It's uh, I got about eight inches of snow here. It's been about ten degrees, Marv. You you watch the uh, the playoff game with the Ravens. Um, listen, I don't need to preach to you about race and the game and the sport. Who owns it? And who controls it? And where we are? And I, I've now been blackballed, and I'm only Latin. Um, in the case of Lamar, and not just race, but style, and the thought that we're gonna have a running quarterback. Injured last year, injured the year before. You know about injured quarterbacks in January. Um, Joe Burrow's injured in Cincinnati now, which opens the gates for a lot of things. But keeping him healthy and then believing in this, seeing this thing through. And this whole, can he be a pocket passer? Can he throw the ball? Can he be an accurate passer? All of those things. He's dispelled every single thing except winning these two football games. These are the last two things, and as you know, the hardest thing in the world to do. But for him to change the game, and John's talk revolution and all that, there were a lot of people who just thought you couldn't win with this kind of quarterback. No matter his race, no matter his size, Cam Newton, whatever, they, they'll, get, they'll, they'll just get beaten up too much to be able to play in week 19 and week 20. There's no question about that. And uh, you got to credit, I think, first off, John, and, uh, you know, coming from him and him uh, constructing the offense, getting the offense constructed to, to utilize and, and really uh, uh, accentuate the skills of Lamar. And then from, from Greg to now Todd, uh, the coordinators and so forth, James Urban, who was with him as a young, uh, is it when he was a rookie as a quarterback coach in the quarterback room, uh, they really built everything around him. And it's been really, really cool. Uh, to see and watch his growth. And then Todd comes in this year, and, again, they pick things up. You know, early in his career, they had the tight ends on the inside, and they worked. This year they signed Odell. So they give him those inside threats and, and then the opportunity for him to stretch the field downfield for the long balls. So uh, they've really done a great job of personneling around him, uh, always being able to feature the run. But he becomes the 11th guy. And when he's carrying the ball, now it's all even on defense. Well, I mean, for you being thought of as the defensive-minded guy to take an offensive guy and who has skills, there are things he can do that you could never think about doing with Carson Palmer or John Elway or anyone, right? Like things you can do offensively, but then also the things he can do to you defensively that you learn from, to your point, like first game, first third down, oh my God we got a different kind of thing that's going to happen here. Uh, apples and oranges, however you would have it, but seeing the game differently that no one ever thought this could be successful enough to have to worry about it other than 
gadgetry or gimmickry or whatever, that at some point the forward pass would have to be part of this, that it really wasn't in 18 and 19, and they were trying to make it part of that. But then there comes all the weapons and everything that has to happen around a quarterback to make this very, very unique thing effective. Yeah. You know, the the thing about it is they've continued to build. And you know what? They stayed in the lane. They, you know, if this is what it's going to be, this is how we're going to win. This is how we're going to win. And uh, and we're going to protect him as best we can. Uh, we want him to protect himself as best we can. So it's kind of a twofold thing. Getting a guy like that who is a horse unsaddled to sit back in the pocket and pat the football and then to move east-west instead of north-south with the football when he has the ability – The sticks are there. He knows he can get the sticks. No, no, no. He's going to wait for Zay Flowers to break. Boy, there's there's a lot of things we've seen him physically do this year, really the last eight or ten weeks, that I don't know that we thought he could do it but hadn't been coached to do it, but never thought he could have success doing it because it was just so easy to take off and get the sticks, right? Like when he had that ability to beat you on third down and 18 – We didn't see this coming, and they have forced this issue, and it's made him that much more dangerous because he does throw the ball a lot better than he was ever given credit for. Yeah, he really does. And, you know, he showed that in his workout coming out. Uh, You know, he had had thrown the ball well at Louisville. And, uh, you know, but it it gets to be a different thing. Your windows are all tighter in the National Football League. And so that that changes a little bit. But but he's excelled at it. Uh, They've done a great job of – of winning and he's embraced it. And and the thing you said earlier in the conversation, he plays with a chip on his shoulder. Well, and so does Patrick Mahomes though, right? I mean, doesn't yeah. matter how many times you win. Joe Flacco had won, but he had a chip. I mean, that's part of all of this at this level. And I think that's what makes it such a heavyweight fight this week, right? Yeah, it really does. I mean, there, there's a, uh, there's a certain attitude for a guy to be gifted and good. You mentioned, you know, Carson Palmer, you mentioned an Elway. And those guys all had that it factor and uh, the ability to take it to a new level and uh, and get their teammates to respond. You happy? How are things? How's your hip? How you doing? I mean, you're yeah, back in the league good. sort of kind of. You, you don't have a job with the Raiders. You're going to make that clear, right, at this moment, right? I, like, I don't currently have a job with the Raiders. I'm just on vacation. So, uh, But, no, uh, eventually something will likely work out. But whatever he needs me to do, um, I uh, really – uh, it's been great to help him and uh, him, you know, being a kind of a sounding board for him to bounce things off of. What'd you learn from all these kids at Tempe, man? You're running around with all these young, young people here, right? I tell you what, uh, this last week, though, being in Honolulu with these high school kids that are just entering college. Now, that was a new level. Now, there was about a handful of them you would take right to the National Football League tomorrow. That's how gifted they were. So that was a lot of fun because the Polynesian Bowl is high school kids uh, who are just entering college. A lot of them have already uh, started school in January and they got permission from the universities to come play in the All-Star game. And it supports the Polynesian Hall of Fame, uh, which was pretty incredible, where they were inducting uh, Doma Tapeco, who spent a little time in Baltimore there at the end. Uh, Makes a nice sandwich out in Beverly Hills, from what I understand as well. Yes. And uh, so uh, <laughs> Domata was one of the inductees. He also uh, coached the D-line on my squad. And uh, it's, it's really great. The, the coaches are all basically uh, from the islands, uh, either Polynesian and uh, been doing it for a while, uh, or Southern Cal- or California, and come in to coach the game. And uh, it, it was fabulous. It's, it's 100, approximately 100, probably of the top 30% of, the top 150 guys in the country. You know, people see uh, Tua Tonga Valoa or his brother from Hawaii. They come play here. We've had all sorts of Polynesian players back to Ed Mulatalo. And yeah. name any of the guys from the islands, uh, the, uh, Maki, Kimiatu, a bunch of these guys. Yeah. I spent time in Oahu a number of years ago and now over in Maui a couple of times. And I had never – Nobody ever told me how nice Hawaii was till I I swear to God, I turned down the Pro Bowl when I was at Sporting News Radio to go to our parade back in 01. I remember you and I together on the bus with Marcus that day. Uh, Now I see him coaching with you over there. But nobody told me, first off, how beautiful Hawaii was. and how Like, literally, I spent my time in Jamaica, the Caribbean, whatever, West Coast, Florida. Hawaii's great. 
But the football culture there, and even just driving around Little Maui, you see football. Football is absolutely the king in Hawaii. Yeah. And when you go over there, it's beautiful. But they love football. Love football. It's part yeah. of the birthday. All the Asian community loves football, and uh, I mean, it really is. It's it's special to them. And and Mark is actually coached in the Hula Bowl. That's with right. Ryan Billy and That's Mike right. Smith, which is in Orlando now. <laughs> so he's not with you. No, he's here on vacation, but uh, he was in Orlando with with uh, Brian. He coached the tight ends for Brian. See, I was stupid enough to see him with Brian at the Hula Bowl and thought, oh, they're all in Hawaii. Brian's in Hawaii. Then I'm like, they're in Orlando. They don't have holas yeah. in Orlando. They have holas in Hawaii. Yeah, Aloha Stadium is condemned. So there's a plan to uh, uh, eventually got to knock it down and rebuild it. And uh, so – they moved the Hula Bowl to, to uh, Orlando two years ago. I had no yeah. idea Aloha Stadium was so close to 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 where Pearl Harbor is, you know, in Oahu. It's like, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, right I got there. the lay of the land when I went in, and I felt like such a creep. And the Pro Bowl sucks. I mean, not for you guys to get to wear the lays when you go and you're the coach and, like, all that. Well, the but Pro Bowl's like, over now. Now it's a skills competition. So Team Ray. Team Ray Ray. Ray Lewis, right? <laughs> Team Peyton, right? Yeah. Oh, is Ray one of the, the honorary I coaches? I guess. I don't here? know. You know what? That Super Bowl 35 team, if Shannon's not doing it, you know, we're honoring Goose and he's gone, or you're doing it, or Brian's it, Trent Dilfer, it's it, th- that team, Ray, I mean, that Rob Woodson, you, you, all of you show up somewhere because it was just special. 23 years ago, this sat. By the way, this Sunday, we can go, first time we've ever had the AFC Championship, we can go to the Super Bowl. It is the 23-year anniversary of, of the 28th of January of Super Bowl 35. So there have at it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Special time. Yeah, I know. I love you. Go back to the pool. I love you, Marv. Um, All right. Good Jessica luck. Coco, go Listen, <laughs> I've worn Bengal stuff for you. I've worn Arizona. I've, I didn't wear any of that Washington burgundy goal. But listen. You get a gig with the Raiders because of JT the Brick and because of your love for Antonio Pearson, because you're sort of grandpa pa now to the organization, and you can win a Super Bowl again. I'll wear some Raiders stuff for you, okay? All right? So, All right. Everybody want, always wanted to be a Raider. You know that. I Come on, I'm the original it's, it's Rebel. You know that, right? You know, I'm it's the original Rebel. Right. Yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> I, you know that. You know that. And I, as you know, I have a commitment to excellence. You know that. So, uh, Marvin, I love you. Take care of yourself, all right? All right, Ness. Good to Hi talk to you. Hi to Peggy and all the grandkids, the daughter, everybody. I, you all know, right. get out there and enjoy okay. yourself. Enjoy right. your life. You <laughs> suffered in this league long enough. Enjoy your life, Marvin Lewis. Uh, I love Marvin. Joe Flacco's been here this week. Brian Billick's been See here ya. this week. Him here. See you later, Marvin. Back to the pool. He's he's coaching a Polynesian Bowl. My God, the 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 sacrifices Marvin Lewis makes to come on the program. I text him. He's like, I'm at the pool. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> we are doing the first annual. A cup of soup or bowl. We're doing Crab Cake Row, and we're doing it at five different locations. Uh, on Monday, February 5th, we're going to kick it off at Fadley's. We're going to be live from 9 to 5 all day long, old school live radio, live webcast, celebrating 100. It's a noble goal of mine. I've only got like 35 right now, so if you got one, Ness at BaltimorePositive.com. 100 charities in the area, all of it coming together for the Maryland Food Bank. So a cup of soup or bowl. You come, we give you a cup of soup or bowl, Maryland crab, cream of crab. All you need to do is bring something nice for the Maryland Food Bank and, and donate and give during the coldest week of the year week before valentine's day uh, i've covered 27 super bowls i've been on 27 radio rows this is the first time we're doing our crab cake row and a cup of super bowl for everyone brought to you by the maryland lottery and our friends i got some raven scratch offs to give away i have some oh snaps um gingerbread our friends at window nation 86690 nation and jiffy lube multi-care bringing it together all the information at baltimore positive if you have a charity hit me quick so i can get them in nest at baltimore